Hello. Well, uh, this is kind of how we're going to present information on electric circuits. I'm also going to provide you information uh, with physics classroom readings and videos by professionals or people who um, do this regularly on YouTube. But I figured I'd do my best to give you a shot to understand it uh, based on my understanding and how I present things in class. So there's going to be three lectures, the first of which is going to be based requirements for complete electric circuit. So I'm going to leave this up here. I put lines on these sides of the board to let me know where I can write. So hopefully you can hear things, um, and then if you have questions about the lectures, you can come to office hours and ask those. So basically what we need in order for electricity to flow in a circuit, we need a complete path. So if I have something like this, where I've got a battery, and oftentimes we think of a battery like this, like a six volt battery. This would be a D cell, which is a one and a half volt battery, something like that. You've got batteries in your phones, you've got batteries in your watches and things like that as well. But normally what we would think of is we think of a source of energy. We think of one side of the battery as being positive, one side being negative, and that's gonna be way too small for you to see. So let me try that again. Something like that, I guess. Um, at any rate, what's going to happen is that would not allow electricity to flow because these aren't connected. And I'm not going to get into the chemical nature of the battery about how one side has more potential energy than another. But we tend to think of conventionally as current flowing from positive to negative. We think of positives as flowing as conventional current. In reality, we know it's electrons that are flowing. Um, I won't get into the details of why people think of positives as flowing. It deals with history and a mistake before people knew whether the charges that moved in wires were positive or negative. However, this isn't all we need. We don't just need a positive and a negative terminal. What we need is we need a conducting path. So we need a way to go from, say, here to here, like a wire. Now, if all I had was a wire between the positive and negative terminals, what would end up happening right now is that would be a short circuit. So this wire we would think under ideal conditions is having zero resistance. Well, if you have a difference in potential energy from here to here, and you end up having no resistance, that means you're going to have a heck of a lot of current. Technically, it would be an infinite amount of current. But in reality, most wires have a little bit of resistance, and again, we're going to ignore that for the most part. So normally, what you need in for a circuit to function you need a difference in potential energy, which we call voltage. Uh, voltage is energy per charge, and we need a conducting path. So oftentimes we would show something like this. It doesn't matter how you show it. We could show a light bulb here. Something like that. And once it's connected, lo and behold, the light bulbs light up. Okay. Now we're going to use circuit elements that are a little more simple than this because as you can tell I can't draw very well. You know that from all year. And so drawing a battery like this every time, light bulbs and things, is going to be a little bit complicated. There is one thing about light bulbs I'm going to draw in detail a little bit later. But I'm going to erase this right now. I'm going to show you the um, diagrams for how we're going to use things in class. Again, these are going to be on the physics classroom as well. Normally what we'll end up doing is showing a power source with a potential difference, which we measure in volts, is something like this, either a short line and a long line. Sometimes you'll see multiple short lines and multiple long lines for a battery as opposed to just a, a power source. The short line is the negative side and the long line is the positive side. So if I drew just one of those, be something like that. A wire is simply a line. Now normally if you have um, a resistor, a lot of times it's a light bulb, but it can be other things as well. So for example, the wire in your toaster that get really, really hot when you want to make toast, those are resistors. And they're resistors because they're made of different material and they're skinnier than most normal wires. So we tend to draw resistors as a squiggly line. 
something like that. So this particular circuit would have three resistors. And we might label this in terms of the voltage. So let's say this is a six volt power source. So I would label that as six volts. These resistors have resistance in ways that are called uh, resistance is measured in ohms. So let's say this resistance is three ohms. Ugh. The symbol for ohm is the Greek letter omega. Looks kind of like a weird upside down horseshoe. Symbol for volts is V. So let's say this resistor might have a six ohm resistance. And this one might have, say, I don't know, uh, a 9 ohm resistance. And we'll talk about series circuits later. This is an example of a series circuit. If you want to determine the current in the circuit, you need to understand the voltage and the resistance. So we're going to get into the calculations in just a little bit. Um, current. is the rate at which electricity flows. So it's measured in amperes. Or amps. One amp is equal to one coulomb, which I think we discussed right before we left, is a giant amount of charge. And that's one coulomb traveling through something for every one second. So if you had 2 coulombs per second, that's 2 amps, 5 coulombs per second, 5 amps, 0 0.35 coulombs per second, 0.35 amps. So something like that. Now, uh, so current is measured in amps. But the symbol for current, which is a little bit odd, is I. That's the symbol. You could ask me why that is, and I could BS my way into thinking that I remember that. I don't. I do know that since C is the symbol for Coulomb, you wouldn't want current and Coulomb to be confused. So that's the symbol for current. V, symbol for voltage. R is the symbol for resistance. Now the units are a little bit different. So the units, if you remember, for current are amps. The units for voltage is the are the easiest one, volts. The units for resistance are ohms. And the symbol again is that weird symbol here. So those are the primary things that we're going to be thinking about. We'll also talk about power a little bit, which is the rate at which energy flows. So come back in just a couple minutes about that. So now I'm going to get into equations. Ohm's law is the primary equation we're going to use for solving things in circuits. So Ohm's law is a ratio of current, it's a ratio of voltage over resistance. So I is equal to V. Really, it's a potential difference. It's a difference in voltage. So I'll say delta V over R. That's one to remember. Write down if you took your formula sheet, so things like that. So <clears throat> I've seen it also written as V equals I times R. And I prefer this way to think about it because 
This explains to me that this voltage, which is an, a difference in energy per charge or poten difference in potential energy, is the push that causes current to go. And this resistance is in the denominator. And the more resistance you have, the less current you would have. It opposes a flow of electricity. So that's Ohm's law. The power formula, we determine with power is equal to voltage times current. So if a volt is a unit of energy per charge, that's a joule per coulomb, current is a rate of flow, a coulomb per second. So if we multiply those together, we get joules per coulomb times coulombs per second, that's joules per second. Well, the units for that are something we've heard of before. One joule per second is actually one watt. So this is probably familiar to you in terms of electricity because one watt is equal to a unit that you, a lot of times you'd see on a light bulb. So a lot of times you might see a 60 watt equivalent light bulb, a 100 watt equivalent light bulb, something like that. So that's the big idea. Um, again, additional resources are in the physics classroom, electric circuits. There's parts of lessons two, lessons three, and lessons four I think are going to be important, and I'll get that out in the syllabus. Thanks. Hello. This lecture is about how to solve for uh, circuits that are called series circuits. In other words, um, how to determine how to calculate voltage, current, um, resistance, and uh, how to use those later in figuring out aspects about combined circuits. Series circuits are the most simple type of circuit. They have only one path for electricity to flow. And Ohm's law which is I equals voltage divided by resistance, and the power formula P equals voltage times current, apply to any part of this circuit or the whole circuit. That's actually kind of important. So these formulas are pretty straightforward. They're not hard to use, but the thing is, is you gotta remember that they can be used in any part of a circuit or a whole circuit, as long as you're thinking about your logic correct with how we solve for series circuits and later on how we solve for parallel circuits, and finally how we solve for combined circuits, which have aspects of both series and parallel circuits. So in this case, once again, one path for electricity to flow. We're going to find the total resistance of the circuit by simply adding up the resistance values. We're also going to find that current is the same everywhere in the series circuit. And finally, we're going to discover the voltage or potential difference that's used, and I want to use that in air quotes, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, across the resistors adds up to the total voltage provided by the battery or the power source in the circuit. So those rules are going to apply for any series circuit. So I'm going to do an example here um, that I think I'm going to provide to you on a written document as well. So in this particular case, and I should look to see what it looks like, I've got power source up here. It's a 12 volt power source. If you remember, the short line is the negative, the long line is the positive. We will think of positives as flowing, so they're going to flow away from the positive because positives repel positives. I'm going to have an ammeter, which I locate anywhere in here. I'm going to use that as a red color. And I'm going to call that. Again, an ammeter. We put ammeters in series with the uh, part of the circuit we want to measure current because the current's going to be flowing through the ammeter. That's going to allow us to measure it properly. Next, we're going to have a resistor here below this. One at the bottom of the circuit. One over on the left side of the circuit. I'm going to say that this resistor, which is the first one, is going to have 5 ohms of resistance. Remember, that little weird horseshoe thing is the symbol for ohms. Down here, I'm going to have one with 3 ohms of resistance. And over here, I'm going to have one with 4 ohms of resistance. So 
The other things I'm probably going to want to solve for are to figure out the voltage across each of these. So I'm going to put a voltmeter here. Now a voltmeter has to be hooked up in parallel, meaning beside the device you want to measure the voltage of. Why? Because it literally is measuring a difference in potential energy from one side to another. So really this is joules per coulomb of, of energy that's different from here to here. If I put a voltmeter across a wire, say down here, if there's no resistance, it's not going to take any effort or energy to go through that wire. So this voltmeter would read zero volts. But here, it does take effort or electrical energy to push the electrons through in this location. So we need to measure a difference from one side of this resistor to the other. Likewise, we're going to have a voltmeter here and a voltmeter here. So the first thing that I'm going to want to do almost always when solving for circuits, if I don't need to simplify the diagram, I'm going to want to make sure I find the total resistance. For the total resistance, I just find by adding up the resistors. You might say, well, why is that? And in this case, that's 5 ohms plus 3 ohms plus 4 ohms. 5 plus 3 is 8. 8 plus 4 is 12. 12 ohms. So I've got a little demonstration to show that, so give me a moment to get this material because I forgot it. Okay, so this is a hose used can, to carry air or water. And I think the idea behind this is, is if you have it connected to something like air here, that's fun. The same amount of air is going everywhere in this hose because there's only one hose. But if I put a crimp in it, I can slow the amount of air passing through that hose. It doesn't slow it just at the crimp, it slows it everywhere in the hose. It slows the amount coming in, going through here, through the crimp, and after the crimp coming out. So if I have multiple kinks in the same hose, you could imagine that it's going to affect the whole hose even more. So if I have two crimps, it's going to slow down the, the flow of air more. Three crimps, even more. So if I have a crimp that's loose, it'll only slow down the flow of air a little bit. If I have it where it's tight, it's going to slow it down a lot. Now this liquid or flow analogy is not perfect with respect to electricity, but it's not bad. So we'll use that to start our understanding. And I've got water over the floor, which is going to be fun. All right, so in this particular case, I've got 12 ohms of resistance. The next thing I would probably want to do is figure out the total current. So that's the current going through here. And notice it's not going to matter whether I put the ammeter here or here or here or here. If I have only one path for the electricity to flow, the current's got to be the same everywhere. I can't have more electrons or charges passing through this spot than this spot or this spot. And that goes back to the law of conservation of matter. So in this particular case, you remember the symbol for current is I, so I'm going to say the total current is going to equal to total voltage divided by total resistance, which I've already written the number down. It's not helpful. So that's 12 volts or 12 ohms. That's 1 amp. So the current in this circuit is 1 amp. What about the voltages? Well, basically, if I have a 12 voltage difference from this side of the battery to this side of the battery, that means I've got to use up 12 volts total throughout this entire path. Hopefully it makes sense that a circuit element with more resistance is going to take more voltage to overcome 
than a circuit element with less resistance. So it's going to take more of this voltage, which I like to think of as like the push that makes electricity go. Um, and resistance is the opposition that opposes that. So I'm going to use a different amount of voltage here than here than here. How would I figure out how much? Well, I'm going to go back to Ohm's law, but I'm going to rearrange it. And I'm going to say V is equal to I times R. Now I know that the current going through each of these resistors is the same. It has to be because it's a series circuit. So in this case, if I want to figure out the voltage across the 5 ohm resistor, I'm going to say 1 amp times 5 ohms, and that's 5 volts. Same way the voltage across the 3 ohm resistor, 1 amp, 3 ohms, 3 volts. And then finally, the voltage across the 4 ohm resistor is obviously going to be 4 volts. Now notice my wording here. I'm saying that it's a voltage across the resistor. It doesn't go through it. Voltage doesn't flow. It's current that flows. So the current is flowing through the resistor. Voltage is a difference in potential energy from one side to another. The other thing that's nice by doing these calculations, what we can see is that I lose 5 volts across the first resistor, 3 across the next one, 4 across the last one. 5 plus 3 plus 4 means I've used up 12 volts. That agrees with the fact that I have a 12 volts difference from this side of the circuit to this side of the circuit. So I should use up all the voltage that's provided. Now, the reason I set up this circuit like this with the 5 ohm resistor first is a lot of times people always think that you have um, the most voltage or the least voltage used across the first resistor. But if I switch this, and I made this the 5 ohm resistor, and this the 3 ohm resistor, the values don't change. It's just that this one would end up being um, the one that uses the most voltage. In this particular case, if we want to figure out the power in the circuit, by the way, power is equal to voltage times current. So the total voltage here is 12 volts. The total current is 1 amp. So this would be a 12 watt circuit. That would be the amount of power that's provided. So hopefully that makes sense and you can ask me questions about those during office hours. Welcome back. Our final lecture on electric circuits uh, that I'm going to be doing deals with parallel circuits. And parallel circuits still follow the same equations as we did earlier with Ohm's law and the power calculation. And if you compare this to the last video, there's some notable differences. One thing is that parallel circuits, by definition, have multiple paths for electricity to flow. I've got one drawn over here, and you can note that the battery or power source of 12 volts, which is the same as I used in the series circuit, is over here on the left. But then I've got one branch here, another branch here, and finally a third branch over here. I've got an ammeter located here to measure the current going through the main part of the circuit. And by the way, one thing I didn't mention before, a lot of people think that the um, battery provides charge. The battery does not provide charge. It provides an energy to push the charge. So it's not that charge gets used up as a battery wears out. It's basically that that difference in energy or potential difference across this gets used. And that even might be a little bit simplified right there. But I want you to understand the charge that flows through here also flows through the battery. It's just the battery gives that charge extra energy to push it along through chemical processes most of the time. All right, so I've got an ammeter also designed to measure the current through this branch, an ammeter to measure the current through this branch, and an ammeter to measure the current through this branch. I've only got one voltmeter in the circuit, and the reason for that is going to be listed down here. So big idea, multiple paths for electricity to flow. This is the other thing that's tough for students to get their heads around. How we determine total resistance is quite different in parallel circuits. And I'm going to need you to practice this a bit because it's easy to make mistakes. So essentially what ends up happening is the more branches we have, the less resistance that we have. 
Now you might think, well, wait a second, that seems a little odd. Well, let's go back over here. I'm going to use a small whiteboard to hide parts of this circuit. If I think of a very simple series circuit over here, which only has a 12 volt power source and a 3 ohm resistor, 12 volts divided by 3 ohms gives me 4 amps of current. There would be 4 amps of current going through that particular branch. Well, now, if I have a circuit with only a 4 ohm resistor, like this, 12 volts divided by 4 ohms in that particular series circuit will give me 3 amps of current. Well, now if I have both of them, and they're independent, if you notice, the current that goes through this branch does not travel through this resistor. So these are independent loops of the circuit, and each loop has 12 volts across it, because voltage is a potential difference. And in any loop of a circuit, you've got to use up all the voltage. So really what I've got here is I've got current going through here, more current going through here. Combined, I would have... 4 amps through here, 3 amps through here, 7 amps. And so that means, if I think about my Ohm's law, V divided by R, 7 amps is equal to 12 volts divided by a much smaller resistance than if I had only a 3 ohm resistor or a 4 ohm resistor. Same way over here, if I only had this 5 ohm resistor. 12 volts divided by 5 ohms would give me 2.4 amps, and that would be um, the current if I had a series circuit with only that resistor. So as I add more and more and more branches, I actually get less and less resistance. An extreme example of this would be if I added another branch over here. And let's say this branch has a resistor with one bajillion ohms. That's a lot of ohms. So if it's that many ohms, would much current pass through it? No. A tiny little bit of current would pass through it. When I think about the total current in the circuit as being the current going through this branch, plus this branch, plus this branch, and now plus this branch, even a little bit of extra current in the whole circuit means my resistance is a little bit lower. I can look at that by rearranging Ohm's law. Now, algebraically, resistance is equal to change in voltage divided by current. So if my current gets a little bit bigger and I've got the same voltage, my resistance has to get just a little bit smaller. So any additional branch is going to end up giving you less resistance. That's like I said, that's a tough concept for people to understand. So we're going to go back to this circuit now. So multiple paths for current to flow. This is how we can determine the total resistance by adding the reciprocals and then taking the reciprocal of that, which is, again, mathematically something you want to practice. Current in each branch adds up to the total current. So the current in this branch plus this branch plus this branch should add up to the total current provided by the power source. And finally, and this is the part that's easier about um, uh, parallel circuits, is the voltage difference or potential difference across each branch is the same. And in fact, that's why I've only included one voltmeter in the circuit over here. All right, so let's go and try to solve things. Normally, we try to solve the total resistance first. I'm going to have to do a decent amount of math to do this. So when I add fractions here, and you've got to make sure you know how to put this in your calculator, this would be 1 over the total resistance is equal to a third plus 1 fourth plus 1 fifth. Now you can have fractions in the fractions here. So this could be like 3.5 ohms, 4.8 ohms, 5.9 ohms, stuff like that. For what we're doing right now, we're going to keep it pretty simple. And if you're not sure how to add fractions, you need to think about that. I know that seems kind of silly, but a lot of people forget because they've done so much more math than that in recent years. The way I always like to think about it is like pizza pie. So if you had a circuit with three resistors that were each, um, say, 12 ohms, you want to add them, you go... A twelfth of a pizza pie plus another twelfth of a pizza pie plus another twelfth of a pizza pie equals what? Well, and a lot of people will say three thirty-sixth of a pizza pie. Nope. A twelfth plus a twelfth plus a twelfth is three twelfths of a pizza pie. You get a more pizza pie. So that reduces down to a quarter. Three twelfths is the same as a quarter. But one quarter wouldn't equal the resistance of the circuit. It would equal one over the resistance. So I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So if I end up having a third plus a fourth plus a fifth, 
If I put that in my calculator, 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 5, it gives me a number that's not nice and pretty. So essentially I get 1 over RT is equal to 0 0.783 ohms one per ohm, I guess. Well, that tells me 1 over this. It doesn't tell me the value itself. Now there's a couple ways you could do that. You could think of this as being over 1 and now cross multiply. Or you could simply take the reciprocal of this value, which I'm going to do, and push that 1 over x or x to the negative 1 button in the calculator one last time. And I get 1.28 ohms. So that's the resistance of this circuit. Notice the resistance of a circuit that's a parallel circuit is lower than the resistance of the least resistive element. So in other words, this has to be lower than 3 ohms. Um, each additional branch, remember, lowers the resistance of a circuit. So I'm going to put this up here as 1.28 ohms. And now I'm going to go and try to figure out the total current. Well, that's actually pretty easy. Because if I go back to Ohm's law, I know that the circuit has 12 volts. I know that my circuit is 1.28 ohms. So 12 volts. And that comes out to like 9.38, blah, 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 which runs to 9.4 amps. It's a lot of current. What about the current for each of these branches? Well, in order to do that, I need to figure out the voltage across each of the branches. But this is the nice part. So if you remember, the voltage or potential difference across each branch is the same. So that means the voltage across this would be 12 volts. The voltage across this would be 12 volts. And the voltage across this would be 12 volts. It's sometimes called potential difference instead of voltage. So in some ways, you could think of this as being like at the top of a 12 meter hill. And this is the bottom of a hill, or zero meters. So if you think about potential energy, it's like you're going from the top of a hill down to the bottom, whether you go this path or this path or this path. So the flow will be different in each of these paths, but the difference in potential energy per charge, or voltage, won't be. So in fact, I don't have to do any math for this. I know that the voltage across that voltmeter is going to be 12 volts. Now, one sneaky thing might happen is if I put the voltmeter here, there's actually no voltage across that. Why? Well, when I go back to Ohm's law, one of the ways I can use that is V equals I times R. So the voltage in each branch is equal to the current through the branch times the resistance in the branch. But if my voltmeter isn't across a resistor, there does take no energy to get through this particular spot. What's called an ideal wire, ideal meaning zero resistance. So the voltage across each of these branches is across the resistor in the branch. But all of them would have 12 volts. So now, the last thing I can do is go and figure out the current through branch and here and here and here. So I'm going to say A1, where the current through A1 is 12 volts, because that's the voltage across this branch, divided by 3 ohms. I think I mentioned before, that's 4 amps. Here, the voltage, or the current A2, 12 volts, 4 ohms, that's 3 amps. Ugh, kind of messy here. That's A, I'm going to move this. That's a little better. Four amps, three amps, amps. Voltage through this branch, A3, 12 volts divided by five ohms, 2.4 amps. Now, this gets back to the part that I mentioned earlier. The current through each branch in a parallel circuit should add up to the total current. So let's check to see if that's correct. I had 9.4 amps here when I simply took the total voltage provided by the power source 
and the total resistance I figured out earlier. Here, this current through this branch is 4 amps plus 3 amps, that's 7. Through this one is 2.4, 7 plus 2.4 gives me 9.4 amps. Same answer. So that actually is really nice as a way to double check things. So hopefully this helps understand uh, parallel circuits, and again, I'll give supplemental information about that from the physics classroom.